This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. What is Chalkboard Chat? It's an MPB education podcast. It's a variety show providing information and resources for teachers, students, parents, guardians, and everyday people on various topics. It's learning something new with every publication. Chalkboard Chat. Find the podcast or listen from chalkboardchat.mpbonline.org. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest today is a friend of the program, Audrey Harrison. As an entomologist, she studies the insects around us and how they're helpful in our everyday lives. So today we're going to talk about what insects are making their spring appearance. We'll mention monarch butterflies and, of course, everyone's favorite, the mosquito. Dr. Major's here, ready for pet questions, and Libby always likes to hear your recent encounters with nature. So plenty to do to join our conversation this morning. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Here's a reminder, if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursday morning, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. We always like to start out with you. What uh, have you been seeing lately good in your yard? Morning. Okay, it's I, I'm not getting much done other than sitting in the yard and sitting <laughs> on the screen porch watching for things. And our hooded warblers are here. Got the perulas and prothonotaries and indigo bunting showed up two days ago. I was getting worried because I was reading that a lot of people had their indigo buntings. So I saw two males and a female look. Uh, I guess the first time two days ago, day before yesterday, and a great crested flycatcher, which is one of Paul's favorite birds. He was real pleased that he's back. And we went to um, some friends to watch their purple martins. They've got three apartment houses <laughs> full of purple martins, and they were great fun to watch. And also saw an orchard oreo when we were there. We had eight hummers this morning in the rain, so I think they're doing good. Um, all the vireo, red-eyed, white-eyed, and yellow-throated vireos, and um, bluebirds, and Phoebe's nesting, and then our, of our residents, we've got our chickadees nesting, and tufted titmice, and the cardinals are feeding babies, so um, I don't have, I still don't have a wren on the porch. I've always had a wren nest on the porch, and so far, no Carolina wrens on the porch, and I've really um, had a lot of broad-headed skinks and five-line skinks. Got some good pictures of those just lounging around. I, in fact, I've started to need to be careful when I walk out of the back of the house. They don't move anymore if I walk down the stairs, so I don't want to squash one. <laughs> so I guess at the last minute they're probably fast enough to get out of the way. But I'm seeing more of those than anoles this year, and there must be some... Habitat reason I have yet to figure out, but my nose, I'm, I, there are some, but not nearly as plentiful as usual. And for insects, I've been uh, watching and photographing a little bit smaller moths, not the tiny little micros as much, but um, a nice, what, the nine spotted forester moth that I found. Those are really nice. Yeah, I've got uh, white walls under the front porch and the um, the porch light really is good for bringing them in. So I've been leaving the porch light on for a little bit each evening and then just kind of seeing what I get. But that's a lot of fun. And on that white background, Mm -hmm. I can photograph them. And those are really important for the birds that you just mentioned. Um, There's an estimate that Doug Tallamy put out that a single clutch of chickadees to go from eggs to fledglings uh, requires between six and 9,000 caterpillars. Wow. So those moth caterpillars make up the, the majority of those. So and that's amazing on. that there's that many out there. Absolutely. Um, I didn't see but heard my bird that I hadn't heard for in, gosh, a couple of years, but uh, the woodpecker is back. And he all he it's all I think he's doing it on my downspout because it sounds metallic whatever he's hammering on. Have um, you figured out yet which woodpecker you've got? Well, that's the thing I don't even know where to try, try to find. I hear it, and then every time I go anywhere near it, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, but I'm gonna and next time I hear it, I'll make a little concerted effort to mm-hmm. go out there and, and and bring my phone with me so we can figure out what kind it is. But yeah, it's, if uh, you can get a little piece of the of the um. 
of the sounds, the vocalizations, or well, for him, it's the drumming, not vocalization. Yeah. yeah. Although he might be doing both. Um, and I was surprised my cat, I thought, well, he would recognize it and be staring out the window at him, but I, I don't know. My cat has better things to do, I Maybe guess. Maybe he's already used to it. <laughs> you know, they may already know all about each other. <laughs> Uh, so, Libby, you got a few emails uh, recently uh, of people asking about some things. Uh, what did, uh, tell us about the, uh, what is it, tussock moth? Oh, yeah. that's Somebody had sent us a, um, a tussock moth, and Audrey will be interested in. I couldn't tell exactly from the picture, but you know how uh, ma, um, caterpillars of moths are often parasitized by ichneumid wasps. And I think there were some little egg masses on the back of this tussock moth um, caterpillar. That's really interesting. I saw a photograph this week on one of the Mississippi Naturalist pages of a um, of a female moth laying eggs and the female is is not able to fly. She doesn't have fully developed wings and uh, and she was laying her eggs on a, somebody's window screen. And it was very interesting. And I believe it was one of the tussock moths. And is that common for yes. them not to be able to? For that species, it is it is expected that the female will, will not be fully winged. Okay. I'm and that's true of that other insects, some other uh-huh. insects as well. I know there's some of the fireflies that the females don't fly at all. Yeah. The male goes and finds them in the grass. Oh, We've got to mention, and maybe we'll mention it more than once, Adam Ronke, our, our good buddy, Dr. Ronke, with um, Extension Service. The Extension Service and the Museum of Natural Science partner on these master naturalist classes every now and then. I don't think he even does one every year necessarily in the Jackson area. So he's pulling together another class for one that will start May the 16th. And it, uh, this is one that's going to meet on Tuesday. So you will have to have your Tuesdays available for um, eight weeks, nine o'clock in the morning to three in the afternoon. So it's kind of like going to school, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, they do a lot of field trips. So you'll either be in the museum seeing live and preserved things there, or you'll be in the woods there, or you'll go on trips. Uh, Paul and I are going to meet them in Vicksburg to um, talk about the Mississippi River one of those Tuesdays. So if you can possibly make your Tuesdays available, it is just really a lot of fun if you're interested in nature, interested in wildlife, uh, native plants, any kind of ecosystems. And after you finish this course, of course you get certified, and then uh, there are a lot of volunteer opportunities that open up for you all over the state that um, want somebody that has that kind of training, just enough training to do some really fun things to help out with some research projects and events. I mm-hmm. think you've used Master Naturalists yes. a lot. Yes, we have Master Naturalists planning to help out at, the, at Nature Day at the Clinton Community Nature Center on Saturday. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about that yeah. later, too. All right. So look uh, either you can give us a call and I'll send you the information about Master, Master Naturalist, or you can um, find it online several places. You can look on the probably the museum's website and the Extension Service, or just Google Master Naturalist. As usual, Dr. Troy Major is joining us from his clinic in Jackson. Good morning, Dr. Major. Here is uh, another email we got that uh, asked about an additive that you could put in your cat's water to help keep their teeth clean. Have you heard about that? You know, probably for the last 30 years, yeah. Uh, I have to say that I don't know what the additive is. Uh, I would say that chances are good that it's probably not going to work, and uh, I'll leave it at that. I don't know. If it's working for somebody, uh, certainly give us a call or or text us. Uh, What you don't want to do is use something that might be harmful, uh, a lot of this has to do with, I think, uh, odor, uh, the breath of a cat or a dog. And uh, I would say that until I see what some of the ingredients are, I would be a little skeptical of it. Uh, what are some tips that the owners, uh, pet owners can do to keep uh, their pet's teeth as clean as possible? 
Okay, I'll go back to one thing. A lot of it is genetic. I see older dogs who have perfectly pristine teeth with the owner doing nothing or a cat. Uh, the big the big problem is buildup of plaque and tartar. And certainly as that builds up, it certainly uh, causes uh, the gum line to recede. You have root exposure and you get then infection and possibly lose the tooth. Uh, some of it is breed specific. There are certain breeds that have uh, worse teeth than others. Now, a lot of dogs do well on chews. Uh, you need to be careful that they won't swallow something and, you know, cause an obstruction. But a lot of dogs do well with that. And certainly you can brush their teeth. Uh, if you start at an early age, I would suggest massaging the uh the gums, uh, certainly you can use a small toothbrush. Uh, they make certain types of toothpaste that may be attractive to a dog or a cat. More difficult than a cat to brush your teeth. Uh, certainly if a cat will let you do it, you can uh, use maybe a gauze sponge and just massage the gum line. Uh, foods, it's so variable. I've seen awful teeth either on dry food or canned food. And uh, I would say that routine uh, check by your veterinarian and dental care is the most important thing that you can do. Sure. In my case, uh, the only thing in my cat's water are the little dissolved pellets of his food that he, I mean, I guess it's the way <laughs> cats eat where they're going to have to chomp, but he, he is the messiest eater. There's always food on the ground. And like I said, there's usually one or two pieces of food that he drops in his water and it slowly disintegrates. Doesn't seem to bother him yes. too much, but I like to keep it clean. <laughs> Some of, some of the animals are very fastidious about how they eat. Others, it may be all over the floor, uh, <laughs> under the bed, wherever. And sometimes I think they take a little food away and maybe hide it for a snack somewhere. <laughs> I think that pretty much uh, describes my cat, that's for sure. <laughs> right. I had one question about the tussock moth. Uh, how big is that egg clutch or whatever that they lay on the screen? Uh, here. Yeah. They're they pretty, small, pretty small eggs, aren't they? <clears throat> They are very small eggs, but the clutch uh, that I saw the picture of looked like it was about the size of a half dollar. Wow. That's pretty amazing. I noticed on one of my windows uh, yesterday uh, what I consider would be a, a clutch of tussock moth eggs. I'll take a picture of that. <coughs> Since it's on the window, it should be able to get a pretty good, pretty good shot of it. Oh, yeah, it might be that same species. Could that would be, be interesting. But it, they're, they were white, and... They were almost transparent, the whole thing. I just happened to look. I thought maybe the window was dirty, <laughs> but it was not. And it's about the size of a quarter to a half dollar. So I just had that question. All right. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. If you want to join our conversation this morning with your question or comment, send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Laura has been patiently waiting for us, uh, calling in from Oxford this morning. Go ahead. You're on the air with us. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, this, is not an, this is not an entomology question, which I'm super interested in, so sorry about that. But this is a beaver question. We have a small lake uh, with a culvert that, that drains, spring-fed lake, culvert drains it out. Beaver's been plugging it up every night for about almost two months. Beaver plugs it up, I unplug it. My question is, will he give up, or do I need to go to the next step? Oh, they are... I think the answer off the air. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Okay. Yeah, Unfortunately, beavers are known for not giving up. Uh, uh, if you if you have some time and you want to do some little citizen science, you can try some things with the sounds of running water. And uh, there's some information on the Internet about it that is really fascinating. They are sparked by the sound of running water, and they like to stop it. And so if you can project that sound in another place, they'll go and build a dam in the other place. Um, I don't know. Anyway, there were a lot of cool things about beavers. So you might check online. Uh, you know, beaver have been such a problem all over the southeast. But they, in the right habitat, I promise they are a, a great <laughs> asset for a habitat because they build ponds and they build natural ponds and they build them in the right places and in the right way that they tend to not uh, destroy the the flow of a of a creek but if he's damming up your culvert you got to do something 
So sorry, and I, that's my, my only tip is to look online for some ideas of natural control. If you can dissuade them and get them to go somewhere else, there are, you know, of course, there are trappers that will remove them and. Sometimes you can find somebody that will trap them in a live trap and can, they can be moved somewhere. So you could look into that, too, if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in doing. All right, uh, Laura, thanks for your call. Why do they dam up things? I mean, is that... <clears throat> it's, it's very instinctive. And a baby beaver will react to that sound of flowing water and start piling things up. And they learn the kind of the, the, the finer details of dam building from their parents because they start working with their parents at a young age. And uh, they, I think they, people have pretty much decided that maybe the finer details of building that dam <clears throat> are learned. But the desire to do it, it seems to be very innate, which is hard for us as people to understand. But... Yeah, so they, and they do it to create the habitat that they need. And uh, I think that beavers have been underappreciated in, in a lot of places for hundreds of years. And it's not been until more recently than we've, that we figured out that they're really a keystone species in a lot of places. And they can do things that are important, like maintain the water table and keep our streams flowing by maintaining a groundwater connection. So mm -hmm. if you can leave room for beavers, they're part of our native mm -hmm. fauna, and they're really interesting animals. Un unfortunately, sometimes our goals do not align with the <laughs> goals of a beaver, and they do have some goals for themselves. It's yes. all, the, all the silly little statements we make about busy as a beaver and hardworking. Uh, it's pretty true. They're going to stay busy gnawing and moving and, um, you know, working hard constantly. They're just really wired that way. Well, and it's also good to see it's a family affair. You know, I got the kids out there, get them getting out there, working on it early so they don't hang around with the undesirables in the area. <laughs> they actually, are, yeah, the parents are very affectionate and, and loving, caring to um, each other and to the babies. I and hope that's I'm not Somewhat unusual from too much. Yeah. my observation from this chair. I've mean, been in here many years, but that seems a little bit unusual. It's a lot of times it's like ah, the, the thing born, hatched or whatever, you're on your own. So that's good to see a little family bonding out there. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's take another call. Let's uh, go to pick you. And this time, Carol has called in. Good morning, Carol. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Just a reminder, Purple Martins do not eat mosquitoes, they eat dragonflies, that eat mosquitoes. That is true, yes. Uh, but they also eat other, they eat a lot of moths, too. Everything eats moths. And, you know, some moths humans consider to be pests to our, um, to, um, our food crops and our uh, commercial crops. But... Um, so they, they, they do. They eat a lot. You know, it's, it's nobody, I guess, is 100 percent on the positive side, including <laughs> every, all the human beings I know. But uh, that's true. Purple Martins, they, it's probably not that they won't ever eat a mosquito, but a mosquito is pretty small. Who's eating the mosquitoes are probably the tiny little birds. I yes. think, I think that I, it's my theory that that's why the... Um, my ruby crown kinglets are still in the yard, and I think they're getting the early mosquitoes because they're and such probably tiny a lot of little the things. Little non-biting midges too, which is an important part of my research. All right, uh, Carol, thank you for your call. You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. As we mentioned earlier, our guest today is Audrey Harrison, aquatic. Uh, ecologist for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers working out of Vicksburg. So, Audrey, we appreciate you uh, coming back on the show with us. You're also an entomologist. Remind us what that is. Yes, I am a research entomologist, and um, I focus on aquatic insects for my work. Um, sometimes I'm here talking about terrestrial insects, but the majority of my work is on the insects that live underwater for a portion of their life cycle. 
So what would be some of the more common ones that people might be familiar with? Well, some of the ones that have been mentioned already, dragonflies spend almost their entire lives underwater. A lot of beetles live underwater for part of their life cycle. Flies, you've mentioned mosquitoes. I just mentioned the non-biting midges, which are emerging in mass right now. Um, And then there are also some other aquatic insects that are less recognizable but very important, such as caddisflies and mayflies and stoneflies, which are my favorite. So I guess it's in their makeup that if they spend part of their time underwater and part of time out in the air, they must have two ways of breathing, I guess. Yes, and that is a very, very interesting fact about aquatic insects is that they have the ability to survive and thrive in two completely different habitats. And breathing is a big um, is a big function that they had to overcome when moving from aquatic environments into terrestrial environments. And so underwater, they're relying on underwater oxygen, or they have a way of breathing surface oxygen like we breathe. So they may have an adaptation like a snorkel or a siphon that they use to breathe out, uh, breathe air above the water, or they may have gills or um, catch an air bubble to take surface air with them or breathe or respire with the oxygen that is dissolved in the water itself that that's interesting and so is it do they spend their time out of the water generally for the same things like food that sort of thing that's another good question dragonflies will feed above water but for most for most adult insects and for aquatic insects generally the their the part of their life cycle that is on land is their adult life cycle. There are exceptions. But mainly uh, the, the primary reason that they are above land, uh, above water and on land is to find a mate and reproduce and then die. They spend a very short part of their life uh, on land and most of them do not feed or have feeding mouth parts once they become an adult on land. Hmm. That's interesting, though. It's the exciting. It's like I get above them, but that's the end of it. But it's at least they go out with a bang, I guess you could say. <laughs> All right. So um, when it comes to insects, I think a lot of people think eh, they're annoying and we wish we didn't have them. There's too many around or whatever. But talk a little bit, if you could, about the ecological role of especially these aquatic insects. Sure, absolutely. So most of my work focuses on streams and rivers and uh, Our streams and rivers could not function. In fact, we couldn't function without these insects. They are they are responsible for processing all of the all of the debris and organic matter that enters our streams and rivers every fall. Think about our trees. They're shedding their leaves and how we don't see limbs and trees and sticks in the ocean when we go down to the beach. All of that material is processed in the stream and a lot of that processing is done by aquatic insects. Now, most fish species rely on insects as food for either part of their life or for their whole lives. So having a food source underwater is important. Also, those insects have different feeding mechanisms themselves. Some of them filter our water. Some of them gather materials and particles from the water and they and some of them feed on each other and then they take all of those nutrients and when they emerge from the water they are removing all of that in terms of their biomass and putting it back into the terrestrial environment so that completes a nutrient cycle that is this critical for the health of our our water and and our land um and And also, certain insects are very, very sensitive to changes in their environment. And so we can look at what's there, the presence or absence of particular groups and the composition of species that's present, and get a rating for the health of our water bodies. And and so they're very, for us, a very good um, measure of ecosystem health. And that sounds like that would be kind of a an early warning system, as it were. If things are going bad, studying the aquatic insects gives the humans a heads up and say, hey, we need to do something here. One hundred percent. They are truly the canaries of our streams and rivers. This is Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Science. And our guest for the hour, entomologist Audrey Harrison. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. 
And if you missed any of today's show, you can subscribe to the show as a podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Or if you have the MPB Public Media app, you'll have access to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. And as we mentioned, one of the newest features on the Public Media app is the Talk to Us feature. So if you want to interact with any of our shows, you can go to the app and uh, tap uh, tap your way through and uh, leave us a little message. So another way to get in touch with us uh, through our, uh, during our local shows. So, um, Audrey, before we move on to the monarchs, a couple of just a, b- a little bit more on aquatic insects. You talked about how they break down a lot of the stuff that's in our lakes and rivers. And I guess they maybe are kind of divided up into how they eat or their appetites. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, absolutely. There are aquatic insects that are known as shredders, and they do just that. They take a leaf and they absolutely shred it and skeletonize it, leaving only the little veins. There are insects that will take those smaller pieces that the shredders have consumed and and filter those out. Maybe they create little filter nets and they use the flow of water to bring their food to them. Um, some of them will trap filtered material on their mouth parts or their the hairs on their body and then feed off of that. And so different groups of insects process those materials in different ways by feeding in different ways, down to ones that will scrape algae and, and other materials off of stones. There's all there's one group of caddisflies that are actually farmers and they live on 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 large stones and they scrape the the growth of algae off of the stones and then they'll move to another section while the section they just ate grows back and feed on a different <laughs> one and so they farm the algae and and eat eat that growth off of off of rocks and stones and streams. You know I think all of us realize how many insects there are but when you think about it you talked about that the example of say a branch that falls you know into a river or whatever and by the time it reaches the gulf of mexico or whatever it's gone but these insects are so tiny so there must be huge numbers of them doing all this work absolutely i don't know that it could even be counted but the the more that we can do to increase those numbers and make sure that those populations stay strong and healthy uh the better our the health of our river systems will be Back to the phone lines we go. Off to Columbus this time. Judy is on the line. Judy, what do you have for us today? Well, I was interested in in if ants are good for us. (laughs) We have a lot of ants right now, and uh, people are putting pesticides out on the ants. And is this a bad thing, good thing? What about ants? I just I'll start off something and then turn it over to you. I think, but one of the things I might mention is I think that most of what they're trying to deal with are invasive fire ants, which are not natural in our habitat, and they are very hard on many of our native species of insects and birds and even mammals, reptiles. Gosh, I can't think of anything that hasn't been impacted by fire ants. They've been a very destructive introduced species and but that said you have to be careful what you use to control them whether you're using a bait or a poison or if you're using a poison you need to be really sure that it's a a short-lived poison and you need to be very careful with how you use it and where you apply it and all that kind of stuff you don't want the cure to be worse than the um you know than the Disease. The disease, yeah, right. And uh, I know one of the things, you know, for a while there was the big deal about Myrex, and we were just broadcasting it over it, through planes, actually, with an airplane and, and putting it everywhere. And they decided that was not a good way to deal with fire ants, that no, probably we're killing a lot more other things than you were fire ants. So I guess that said, yes, I understand a need to control fire ants, but you've got to be very careful how you're doing it. And Audrey, uh, answer. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Judy. I'm sorry. Um, these are small uh, black ants, and there are a lot of them. They had a lot of little hills around our flowers and. I just wondered if, uh, oh. yeah. Yeah, I have an entirely <laughs> different answer for those. Yeah, I, I okay. try to never kill any of those little black ants. Oh, yeah. I know we have some other introduced species other than just the, the fire ant that Audrey probably knows more about than I do. But if 
if I can detect the, the little honey ants that people call that come in their house, frankly, I just put up with those. Yeah, and some, or of, smash the, them. Yeah. some of the little ants will actually help your, um, your flower beds and your yard by um, providing nitrogen and as a fertilizer. And, and also, um, they're, they're important as a food source for other uh, birds and other insects. And so our native ants are a really important part of our ecosystem. But in using uh, targeted controls on the invasives is really important. All right. All right. Well, that's what I needed to, that was what I was interested in knowing. Yeah, Alrighty. if it doesn't really hurt you badly when it bites you, it's kind of my rule. <laughs> I'll leave it alone. I figure it's something good in the ecosystem. There, I know there are a couple of other exceptions now for some introduced species, but mostly the fire ants are the ones we've got to watch out for. All right, uh, Judy, thanks for the call. And I will say this, I accidentally went and got the mail the other day uh, brushed over the top of a fire ant mound, and I was wearing Crocs. So I think one of them got in because I have this awful bite on the side of my foot, and I, I'm blaming the fire ants. It might not be them, but they're they're a good scapegoat. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like that's exactly what it was. Uh, we've got some phone calls to get to, but first, Audrey, if you would give us an update, maybe on the monarch butterflies. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so the monarch butterflies have arrived. Uh, I. I saw my first monarch butterfly in Hines County on March 27th, and I have seen several since then. I have seen eggs on on milkweed plants locally, and so they are here, and they're on our roadsides, and they're in our flower beds, and they're looking for milkweed. Uh, adults are still arriving as they make their way north to their uh, summer grounds in southern Canada and the northern part of the United States. So keep growing those native plants and, and protect those milkweeds from mowing. Um, if we could hold off on mowing uh, our roadsides for a little bit longer and let the monarchs complete their life cycle, the more monarchs we will have. And the milkweed is just especially good for whatever it is that they need? Yes, it is the only food source for their caterpillars. So the adult Females are seeking out milkweed plants and depositing eggs on those plants, and then that's what the caterpillars eat. All right. Let's uh, move on back to the phone lines. Our friend Mike from Hernando has called in today. Good morning, Mike. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Uh, Audie, you, you would relate to this. I saw the weirdest thing I've ever seen, and I, maybe you can explain it. I was walking alongside a chain-link fence, and just walking in. Here was a monarch butterfly crossing in front of me, he stopped. This is the weirdest thing. He stopped and hovered right in front of the chain link fence, shifted slightly to the side, and then went through it. And his wingtips didn't hit anything. And I thought, you got to be kidding. He was judging distance and got through that fence and didn't hit nothing. Is that common? Well, I've never seen that happen, but I've never been uh, looking for them around chain link fences. But I would not be surprised. These are amazing animals that have uh, that have the ability to fly over oceans down, uh, making this cross continental migration to their overwintering yeah. grounds and then come back. So it, it they never cease to amaze me. Yeah. Well, what amazed me was he was obviously judging the width of his wings, and he slipped right straight through the chain link. That's amazing. And I just stood there with my jaw hanging, hanging <laughs> over. I'm like, this is crazy. You know, birds are masters at that, and um, I think that dragonflies and and all the larger moths and butterflies, it's it's – there's not much mm -hmm. room for a brain in there, but whatever yeah. they They definitely have one. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you've, you've watched how, how hummingbirds can... Oh, I have a hummingbird story, just a real quick one. But, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, they just zip through everywhere and know right where they're going. I had yeah. several on the on the, the feeder the other day, and we had company over eating lunch on the porch, and a hummingbird just came right at the screen porch and got his beak caught in the screen. Oh, my goodness. You know, how tiny. Luckily, we were sitting there, and Paul just went and popped it with his hand <laughs> and pushed it right back through, and the, guy was, the, the little guy was shaking his head and flew off. But that made us realize, God, why doesn't that happen all the time? Yeah. We've got all this yeah. window screen and all this, but they to be just right. Almost all the time, <laughs> they're so body aware, you know, and their lives mm -hmm. depend on it. So that's they've evolved to to be um, really conscious of their body. 
You know, if you're if you're observant, nature is staggeringly unbelievable. If yes. you're very observant. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I've always said any time you really take the time to pay attention to any organism mm-hmm. They're always smarter than you think they're going to be. Absolutely. That's one thing that I have that's been uh, put on display to Mm me by researching the Mississippi River is that that there are insects, uh, lots of insects that are especially adapted to living in the main channel of this, the largest river in North America at the bottom. They're adapted to getting their eggs to the right place and they can live in the shifting sand dunes in the main channel and have really interesting ways of feeding and then somehow complete their life cycle, emerge into the terrestrial environment, find a mate and do it all over again. It's really amazing. Yes, it is. And we, it's been a fascinating conversation this morning. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. And our guest for this hour is entomologist Audrey Harrison. Got some phone calls to get to, so let's begin again by going to Gaucher. Diane has called in today. Good morning, Diane. You're on the air with us. Oh, good morning. I have a, uh, I don't know if they're grasshoppers or locusts, when they're really, really small, like babies, they have this, like, orange slit that can strike down the back. And then when they get to be adults, they're very, very pretty. But there's too many of them. Uh, How can I get them to move to another location? Please don't get rid of them. You're so lucky. Those are lubber grasshoppers, and they have very patchy populations. So you have a lot of them, and your neighbors probably have zero. Um, we had them at uh, at our at the house that we lived in before our current house, and I miss them so much. The babies, like you say, are so cute. They're black with that red stripe, and then the adults are gorgeous yellow with lots of different colors, and they're really big, and and you are truly lucky to have them. So if you can put up with them, just enjoy them and watch them, uh, watch all of the unique things they do. The little babies will climb to the end of a blade of grass every night and kind of sleep there at the end of the gla- of the grass. And I really, really miss watching them. When I first realized, I didn't realize, I just saw them, like you say, on the blade of grass and I thought, the grass is burnt. I don't know what I thought. <laughs> and that's when I first realized. And no, they're not in my neighbor's yard. They were in my neighbor's yard the first year. And then after that, they've been vacationing over at my residence. <laughs> okay, then. They <laughs> like you. They like you best. Yeah, you're <laughs> lucky, and I'm jealous. <laughs> What did you call them again? They are lubber grasshoppers, eastern lubber grasshoppers, L U B B E R. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Diane. Uh, thanks for the call. And I would say, as you said, she might have them in her yard and not in the neighbor, but next year it might be they're all in the neighbor's yard and not in her yard. So if you can put up with it, it's not like they're going to be there forever. And plus, as you say, it's it's all part of nature. Absolutely. All right. Uh, one more phone call or another phone call to get to. Our friend Mikey has called in from Mobile. Good morning, Mikey. You're on the air with us. Good morning. I've had the lovers, and um, they are an adventure, um, uh, particularly if you're a plant lover. And that's what I'm calling about specifically now. I have a patch that grows in a suburban setting. It's about the size of, um, you know, a parking, like where you park a suburban van. And uh, it's like street light, and it's full of, um, I think it's milk thistle. Is that the same thing as ragweed? Secondarily, um, because of the crazy weather that we've had, I have put off pruning things that I otherwise would have pruned a, a month ago. So uh, my question is, on which part of the plants or those plants, because it's it, 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 lots of other butterflies, you know, end up coming around too, thank goodness, you know, um, uh, which part of the plant do the eggs get laid, on the green part that's coming out or on the part that's left over from last year that you haven't pulled up yet? That's a good question. Um, So two different things. The milk thistle is different from ragweed, and it's also the thistles are different from milkweed. Um, So the thistles... uh, are are not going to be a host plant for monarchs, although a lot of insects use thistles um, and for 
as a as a nectar source and are good pollinator a good pollinator plant. Um, but the milkweeds, um, which are in a different family of plants, are the the eggs are going to be laid on the new growth of that. So you can go through and prune out the old growth if we if you have time. And probably by waiting, you allowed for a lot of insects that overwinter in that patch to complete their life cycles, like some of our native bees uh, that live in the stems of different plants. Um, and so, and to address your first comment, yes, the the grasshoppers and other insects do eat our plants and i like to say that if nothing is eating your plants then your plants are not part of the ecosystem and well, so i've got a healthy life yes you do you do and i didn't make that up i read it somewhere but i have stuck I to either. it yes yeah, so so your 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 patch and your plants are important especially if things are eating them because that means that you have created an ecosystem that can be used by our native fauna well, I should, I guess I should say if other animals and, you know, insects and besides me aren't eating them. Yes. Right? <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Mikey, thanks for your call. Uh, let's go now to Clinton. Michelle has called in today. Good morning. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Hi there. Um, I have a question for Audrey. Uh, she mentioned the importance of native plants to our pollinator populations. Um, where in the Jackson area can I find native plants for use in my own yard? That is a that's a great question and native plants aren't always the easiest species to find and we plant native plants because they're adapted to growing in our area and they have also um, evolved with all of the insects that have that go and our birds that that go along with those native plants so our native plants are associated with our native fauna and to have one you have to have both and um, and so sometimes sourcing them can be hard. Um, in central Mississippi, there is a plant sale this weekend on Saturday morning from 8 until 2, actually, at the Clinton Community Nature Center as part of Nature Day. And there is an excellent variety of native plants available at this sale. And many, many, many of these plants have been propagated from local sources of seeds and, and plants. And so come out to the Clinton Community Nature Center and we'll get you fixed up with native plants for your yard. And anywhere you live in the state, it would be a good idea to just, um, I guess, make a search for um, nurseries and then call them before you go and ask them if they carry native plants. Absolutely. In North Mississippi, there's Camp Creek Natives. In South Mississippi, there's the Crosby Arboretum. They have plant sales. Um, so there are different places that have native plant sales, but they're kind of scattered throughout the state. So if you're in Central Mississippi, there is one this weekend. I think next weekend, the Me Metro Master Gardeners are having a plant sale that includes some natives, some heirloom plants uh, and ornamentals. So just check around and do continue to plant natives because that's our best hope. All right, uh, Michelle, and also a reminder, Felder Rushing, the Gestalt Gardener, every Friday morning at 9 on MPB Think Radio. So if you have questions about native plants, Felder would be glad to help you as well. And, Audrey, if you would, remind us again of the details you gave, just gave us on that plant swa or the plant sale. Okay. Saturday from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. is Nature Day at the Clinton Community Nature Center in Clinton. Uh, it's a free event. Uh, donations are welcome. Um, but one part of that event is a huge native plant sale, and you're going to want to to arrive early to have the best selection people start lining up for those sales very early although uh, they're not allowed to buy them until the plant sale starts <laughs> at eight uh, and there will be a lot of other fun activities that day lots of educational booths including uh, biologists and animal rehabbers there will be exhibits on snakes and bats and insects and fish and mussels etc there will also be live music and food and art there's an art exhibit and local artisans will be coming with their works. So it'll be a great day. All right, we got about a minute left, a little bit longer than that, but let's talk very briefly about the mosquito. Is there anything 
positive that we can say about mosquitoes. <laughs> There's a lot positive we can say about mosquitoes. And mosquitoes are an, a really integral part of our ecosystem. And they provide food for things that live underwater, such as frogs and other uh, organisms, fish, other insects. And then above water, they are also eaten by a lot of, of different uh birds and bats and insects so they're really important in food cycle in the food web um they're all the males are also really good pollinators they're small they can get into small little flowers and some flowers can only be pollinated by small little flies Hmm. so they're important in that regard as well and the the females can be annoying and they can spread disease but they are uh, they have to get a blood meal for their eggs to mature if you want to get rid of mosquitoes i would I would recommend against mosquito fogging. It is ineffective for controlling mosquitoes, and it is very damaging to all of the other insects. So if you can urge your uh, municipality to stop spraying for mosquitoes uh, with fog, you will be doing a service to the ecosystem. A better way to rid your yard of mosquitoes is to use mosquito dunkers, these little uh, tablets, and put them into a bucket of water, but put some grass in there too because the uh, Decomposing grass will attract the mosquito uh, females to lay eggs into those buckets. All right. That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. Funding provided in part by listeners like you. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest, Audrey Harrison, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. 